criminal psychology and forensic science. Every minor detail within a crime scene is necessary to solve a crime. So to be able to identify those minor details, that's what both these sciences teach you. So why solving a crime? These are the two main sciences used and today we're going to give you introductions to them. Okay. So I'm going to start off with telling you the philosophy of solving a crime. So when you're posed with a daunting situation, you all know what a daunting situation is? Okay, a daunting situation is when something is really gruesome, so it could affect you emotionally when you're looking at it. But when you're a detective or a person investigating such a situation, you have to be very clear-minded. So you can't let your emotions affect you while going through a process of investigation because this can lead to tampering with evidence and thus the whole crime uh, unravels. So another thing you have to rely on is experience. If you're a person investigating a crime for the first time, always <coughs> make sure that there is someone with you who has experience. Because with experience comes intuition, which is, being, which is the basic instinct to be able to find out what is important in a crime scene and how to analyze the things that are important. And so if you have experience, it leads to intuition, intuition, which then when you're in a crime scene, you should be able to pick up the right things that you need to solve the crime. The last thing is abductive reasoning. Abductive reasoning is when you create scenarios based on the evidence you have found and these scenarios are known as the hypothesis. And these scenarios are then compared to the evidence and the best scenario based on the evidence is chosen as the conclusive scenario. Now we are going to introduce you to forensic science. So I am going to start off with what is forensic science. Forensic science is the use of science and technology to investigate crimes and it helps um, enforce civil and criminal laws. The main element of uh, <coughs> forensic science is crime, a crime scene. A crime scene is any physical location where a crime is uh, thought to have occurred or has occurred. Um, pri uh, a primary crime scene, uh, scene is basically where the crime actually took place, whereas a secondary crime scene is where an additional evidence might be found. A suspect is a person who is capable of committing the crime and an accomplice is the person who uh, accompanies the suspect in committing the crime. An alibi is the statement given by the suspect uh, and it basically says where the suspect was at the time when the uh, murder occurred or any crime that occurred. Um, the evidences are classified into three forms. Trace evidence. These are evidences that you, can, you cannot see with naked eye or you have to give a very close look. Look, like fingerprint, uh, hair fibers, cloth fibers, um, physical evidence. These can be just looked with naked eye, like uh, a murder weapon, like a gun or a knife. Testimonial evidence. <coughs> these are oral or written evidence, and these are the least reliable source. Look, I just see the principle. This principle is based on trace evidence, which says every contact leaves a trace. Example, I hold a glass, I leave my fingerprints there or I pick up something and I leave my hair, hair stand somewhere. A crime scene protocol. Uh, the first person to arrive on a crime scene is the police officer. Uh, they steal the crime scene and make sure that all the uh, evidences are safe and nothing is moved from its place. And they call all the specialists required at the crime scene. The second part is uh, uh, preliminary observations and interviews are done. So basically they ask questions to the first officer, to the witness and uh, the victim, if the victim is alive. Uh, questions such as how the crime occurred, what exactly happened and what sort of crime is it. And determining the cause of death and uh, the time of the death. So they can determine the uh, time of death by seeing the corpse. Uh, the corpse cool down at one, at 1 degree Celsius per hour and they see the stiffening of lips, rigomatism, <coughs> such things and they retrieve the body and the investigation continues even after. Now I am going to give you a brief introduction to criminal psychology. What is criminal psychology? It is the study of motives, thoughts, intentions and reactions of a criminal. So this is basically what a, why a person has committed a crime, how he has done it, and what the reaction to the crime is of the criminal. You, you also learn things like what the general mindset of a criminal is. And this 
subject is really important while solving a crime because a lot of the time criminal psychologists are called up in court by the jury to help the jury understand better why a crime was committed. <coughs> so I'm going to be talking about the use of the roles of criminal psychology in a judicial system. So the first is the experimental use. This is research done to help with cases like eyewitness credibility tests and false memory tests. To take an example of eyewitness credibility, so you're given a situation where the eyewitness <coughs> is coming and telling you, I have viewed this crime at, um, and it has occurred in front of me, so I can give a statement in court. So the criminal psychologist is the person who determines whether the eyewitness's statement is credible or not. So you ask questions like, at what distance were you when the crime occurred? Suppose the eyewitness says they were at a distance of 100 meters when they saw the crime occur. You then test, based on your knowledge, you test whether it was possible for the person to be able to test something at such a distance or see something at such a distance. This is the experimental use. Next is the actuarial use. This is the usage of statistics to inform a case. So basically a criminal or a suspect is studied over a period of a few days and based on this, conclusions are brought upon. For example, the jury can ask, if we release this person on bail, is it possible that he'd commit a crime or she'd commit a crime again? These are the kind of questions criminal psychologists would be answering. The clinical use. This is the assessment of an individual in order to provide a clinical judgment. This means that the criminal psychologist is the person who determines whether a witness or a suspect is reliable enough to give a statement in court. So are they mentally sane enough to be able to give a statement in court? Suppose the witness is uh, suffering from a mental disorder or disability, their witness statements are not credible in court. So they don't apply in court. And if it's a suspect that has a mental disorder and who has committed the crime, they're usually acquitted of the murder and put in a mental illness hospital. The last one is the advisory rule. The criminal psychologists are also called upon by the police to help them investigate a murder. So the police ask the criminal psychologist what kind of questions they need to ask a suspect to get the right answers out of them to be able to solve a case. <coughs> Next is the Lombroso study. Uh, see, Cesar Lombroso, the French pronunciation, uh, wrote a book called Criminal Man in 1876 where uh, he studied 383 Italian inmates over a period of one year. And then he divided them into three categories. The born criminals, the degenerates, and the insane criminals. Now these categorizations only apply if the criminal has an evident history of crime. So if they've been committing a crime over a period of time. Otherwise it doesn't apply if it's a one-time crime. Um, he's also known as the father of criminal psychology based on his findings. So what are born criminals? These are the criminals who have been born into a family of crime and thus have been influenced in such a way that they grow up to become criminals. For example, people who are born in mafias or gangs, they usually are influenced by their family members and end up joining those mafia or gangs. It is not always true, but it's true in most cases. Degenerates are the people who have suffered mental or physical abuse in the past and this has affected them in mentally in such a way that it causes them to commit a crime in a form of revenge or anything else. Uh, the last is the insane criminals. These are the people who suffer from mental disorders or diseases that cause them to commit a crime. He also studied and found specific physical characters uh, on a gen on a, over a large scale that are usually found in criminals, especially serial killers. They are asymmetrical faces and eye defects. Again, this is only for a few and it's not, it's not like a whole population thing. Not everybody who has asymmetrical faces or eye defects is a criminal. So yeah, uh, this is a nice quote, uh, the face is the image of the soul, is said by a Roman orator called Cicero some 2000 years back. So what he really means to say is that human emotion, human, human emotion and feelings are often expressed in the face and uh, therefore they can be read, studied and analyzed. So today what I'll be talking about is uh, microexpression. This subject has its roots back to what Cicero said 2000 years back. So anyone has any guesses what are microexpression? Expression <laughs> 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 like comes flash of second, but you people generally can't see. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, 
micro expression or brief involuntary facial expression that, that are shown on the faces of humans according to the emotion that they are experiencing that, at that particular moment. So it's a general emotion. The other for only one twenty-fifth or one fifteenth of a second, so like you mentioned, is, is a very quick reaction. Also, it can be only captured by a high-speed camera or by trained eyes. So there are professionals <coughs> and experts trained to detect microaggression on the face of people. Uh, they display there, there are there are seven universal microaggressions like disgust, anger, fear, sadness, happiness, contempt, and surprise. So these are the expressions that are mainly uh, shown on the faces of humans. Okay, so uh, a micro expression in most cases is followed by a simulated expression. So it is followed by a, a fake reaction. So for example, if I am sad and I don't want everyone to know that I am sad, so I try to suppress my emotion or I try to behave happy. So my, my general emotion or micro expression at that period of time will be of sadness. But my simulated expression will be of neutral, of a neutral face or a poker face or of a completely opposite reaction to what I am doing. So yeah, these are the two kinds of simulated expressions. One is neutralized expression, like I said, when you make a poker face. Another is mask expressions, when your expression is the exact opposite of your micro expression. Yeah. I'm going to be talking about the relationship between criminal psychology and forensic science, which is basically what this whole presentation is about. Okay. Forensic science is a vital instrument for the detection of investigation of crime and the administration <coughs> of justice. So basically what they're trying to say is without forensic science you can't solve a crime. You needed to be able to collect the right evidence, you needed to be able to analyze this evidence and draw up a conclusion. How does criminal psychology play a role in this? Criminal psychology is what brings all the evidence together. So you use criminal psychology and you take the evidence you've got and you build up a case or a story using this which is what brings the conclusion of how the crime has been committed. So the reason we've chosen this topic is many of you would have read uh, crime novels or watched mystery TV shows and stuff like that. But you never know what's really going on behind the scenes when a person is uh, trying to solve a case. A lot of the time in the newspaper you would have read, uh, this person has been captured for this crime. But how was he captured? That's what we were trying to explain to you today. So it is a very important thing in our society where crime occurs a lot to know how it has been solved. As it makes the place a lot safer as they're catching these criminals and putting them in jail. That is the end of our presentation. Um, we're going to have a small activity so after this. Before that, uh I just have to give an example. Micro expressions. So the, the the man who actually coined the term micro expression, his name is Paul Ekman, and he has a group based in US. So that group trains FBI officials and uh, State Department officials, police officials, to, on how to detect micro expressions so that they can use them for solving cases and all. So yeah, that's how it's related to criminal psychology. Okay. So for the next activity that we're going to be doing, you need to know a few basic things. And see, these are what to look for in a crime scene. That is photographs of the crime scene, necessary reports. You all know what biodata, autopsy and evidence logs are. Anybody has, anybody needs to know what any of these are? Okay. Warrants, call logs, camera footage, mm -hmm. bank details. What's yeah. evidence log? Evidence log is a list of all the evidence that has been collected on the crime scene. Call logs, camera footage, bank details, <coughs> list of suspects, witness reports, Evidence collected, interview reports of people related to the victim and suspects. Okay. So this list is going to be there throughout your activity. If you need reference, one person from the groups we are going to now divide you into can come and look at it. Also, guys, are there any questions about the presentation setting? Yeah, so we can have this. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you mean to say that it's just a story we now? A good story, you know. What? Because crime is actually a good story. Yeah, but when you involve a story and you give them evidence that relates to the story, the evidence is conclusive enough to uh, acquit the person of crime. But when you make a good story, who has not even done the crime? So that's the thing. You need conclusive evidence. It's the evidence put together with the story that makes the I mean that says this person has committed the crime. So, I quickly brief uh, you all on the activity that you will be involved in this 
in some time. The groups I'll read out uh, a little later. But uh, before that, the activity itself is uh, you will be given a situation in your uh, groups. Each group will be given a situation, the same one. So please do not discuss between the groups. Uh, and you are expected to solve the crime. It is a crime scene that you will be given. Okay? The first information that you will be given is a photo of the deceased and the coroner's report. The coroner is the person who will go and inspect the body where it is found and no dumb things. Okay? So you will be given that. Uh, depending on what you ask for, we will provide you evidence. We have all the evidence that you will require to solve the case. Some other things you might ask for, they are not necessary. If the guy with your group, who is helping you, uh, tells you that this is not required, you can just drop that. Okay? So, but all the evidence that you require will be there in the group. You have to come up with three things. Who, why and how. All three are essential to prosecute the suspect. If you don't have any of these, you might have a very strong hunch, but a hunch is no good. Please understand this. If you actually have to solve the case, a hunch will not go. You will have to establish how it was done and why it was done and you have to support it with some evidence here and there. And the evidence will help you to construct that picture, but you have to do it. Okay? So uh, that's basically your job. Uh, each group will occupy the rooms here and you can you know, sit anywhere in the cluster, but stay within the cluster. Uh, one person will be attached to each group to help and hand out whatever needs to be handed. You might want to interrogate some people, in which case you can go and ask those people to come and ask them questions and note down things if you wish to note down anything. Of all these things that are shown here, you may not require all. Okay? Uh, but some of these things, of course, will be essential and when you ask them, they will be provided. We might have a lot, but we won't give it to you unless you ask for it. Okay? Because you have to investigate, you have to come up with the right questions. Right? Now, since we have many of us here, uh, of all the students, there are five groups, ten uh, each, except one, which is eleven. And since there are a lot of teachers and parents, if they wish to participate in one separate group of, group of uh, teachers and parents together, and that will also be pretty interesting, if they wish to participate. Yeah, sure. Sure? Okay. So, uh, I'll read out the student groups first. Ashutosh. Ajay, Asif, you can come this way. Ashutosh, Ajay, Asif, Akshata, Aditi, Ashish, Arbina, Sana, Areman, Kostuk, and Rishi. The second group will come here. Himali, Kunjika, Krishna, Manjiri, Mukaddas, Manpri, Nanda, Mukha, Pranav, Mukha. And you could actually sit down. Uh, the third group, Preeti, Nivedita, Rahi. Sit down, sit down. Riddhi, come, come this side. So Preeti, Nivedita, Rahi, Riddhi, Sahul. Not there, no. Who is there? Okay. Om. Om not here. Om there. Ujit, Siddharth, Smith, Sayuri and Shiva. Okay, group four. Ram, you can gather here. Ram, Anush, Vincent, Arya, Apeksha, Deepak, Neer, Smriti, Lakshman and Yusra. And the last group, Fateh, Gautam, Gaurav. Last group. Fateh, Gautam, Gaurav, Rashi, Samir, Shiva, Shorya, Sotriyo, Karani, and Viren. This side. That's the group. Okay? Now, uh, whoever is left can be a part of one group and the first. We can continue. <laughs>